Welcome back, friend. Wanting more, are we? Oh, and what's this? You've brought some of your friends with you. We'll gather around. Make yourselves comfortable. Now, my friend, this next part of our tale is about the slow, monotonous aspect of travel, with all the riding and camping and watching and such. Boring, yes, I know, but all necessary to further our thickening plot. Over the first few days, our three adventurers, along with Syndra, that's right, the human woman that was rescued from near death from the ambush of the Call of the Raven cult. You definitely have been paying attention, I see. Well, that's right. She did say she was a member of the Arcanist. What do you mean you've never heard of the Arcanist? Everyone knows about the Arcanist. Well, allow me to bring you up to speed, then. You see, the Arcanists are a faction that practically control the ancient artifacts and magical items market in Alteratus, on authority from the Sovereign Crown as well as the Royal Syndicate. You don't know what the Royal Syndicate is? Oh my, we have much to discuss, but not now. Now, we start with the explaining who the Arcanists are. You see, after the surge, which was a magical, catastrophic event that nearly destroyed not only Alteratus but all of Solaris, the top mages, sorcerers, and other wielders of magic developed a group or faction whose sole purpose was to collect and lock up any powerful artifacts or magical items, keeping them from the wrong hands they claimed to prevent another surge. In my opinion, it's just another tool put in place to be used to control us. But like I said, that's just my opinion. Anyway, it was on the fourth day, somewhere in the afternoon, when things began to get interesting. Our group of adventurers spotted two ravens perched on the road marker in the distance, and these ravens seemed very intent on the group as they approached. Sindra looked to Kelbrix as she quizzically asked, Do you see what I see? As Kelbrix was quick to acknowledge that he did see the two ravens. Sindra, feeling uncomfortable due to her recent experience with the call of the raven cult, tells Kelbrix that she felt as if the ravens were staring into their souls. Cautiously approaching, the ravens called and took to flight once our group reached a certain distance. The ravens flew in a southeastern direction. The raven encounter continued well into the fifth day, as yet again, just as our group of adventurers reached the midday point of their travels, they spotted a deadwood tree off the roadside. This time, there were four ravens perched in the tree's dead branches. As the group rode up cautiously again, they were caught off guard when the ravens sang out in a chorus of calling before taking flight as our adventurers approached the deadwood tree. The birds headed yet again in a southeastern direction as the previous two did the day before. It wasn't until near the end of day seven as night began to spread its wings to take flight that rain began to fall, settling in as fog began to rise. A chill in the night's air could be felt as the party began searching for a place to bed down to rest up for the evening, as well as hopes to ride out the storm. Clopping through the rain-soaked muddy roads is when Kelbrick's attention was drawn to something on the road ahead. Narrowing his vision, he moved Buttercup over to a nearby tree, grabbing a stick as he prayed forth light upon it. Kelbrick tossed it in front of the party in hopes to illuminate whatever was in the road ahead. The rain had other plans as it prevented the small stick from traveling a far enough distance. The light was only able to reveal four cloaked figures on horseback as they barricaded the road ahead. Steam from the horse's breath as well as the figures could be seen, as now everyone was focused on these mysterious riders. The riders kicked the sides of their mounts and the horses charged. The eyes of the riders ignited in a red radiating arcane energy that revealed raven masks from beneath the hooded cloaks. Fear quickly found its way into the hearts of Ari and Gorath. A flash of lightning, a deep rumble of thunder painted the backdrop as the two sides clashed. Steel on steel rang out, echoing through the chilly night air, as the taint of magics and other sorceries hung heavy in the air as well. Over what felt like an eternity for a band of adventurers was over in just a few moments. The call of the Raven Riders had fallen yet again, but not without leaving their marks on our heroes. Finding and taking whatever they could from the dead, they sought out shelter to rest and to heal in hopes of arriving at Key Village by this time tomorrow. My, how the time has flown. It seems it is closing time. What's that you say? You wish to hear the rest? Well, my friends, I shall be in town for a bit longer. Meet here tomorrow around the same time, and I will continue with the next chapter of our gritty tale. Hmm. I shall jot that down. 
I may have just found a timer for this tale. I'd like to welcome you to Crediting Grin, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons real play podcast where we play a campaign set in the fantasy world of Solaris as we follow the chronicles of three adventurers as they explore the continent of Alteratus. It is with my pleasure to present to you the players that will be bringing to life our three adventurers that we will be following. To my right we have Jason, I'm playing Gorath Thunderfist. A Goliath fighter. I'm tired, exhausted, tired of messing around with bird people. And I am Brian. I'm playing Kelbrick's Goldfound, a human cleric. I have no issues with birds, but man, I cannot take a hit. And I'm Katie. I'm playing Ariar Collis, a tiefling rogue who is also very exhausted and terrified of raven people. And my name is Eric, and I will be your dungeon master in this chapter of our tale. Just a small disclaimer for all you bird people out there. No offense. Anyway, as you all awaken from a long rest, both Gorath and Ari were able to complete a long rest. But it was a restless sleep, and you actually wake up tired, and each of you have an exhaustion point. On the other hand, both Kelbrix and Sendra are all well rested and ready to go, especially Sendra, as she gathers what little items and gear that she has as she preps her horse's saddle and mounts up for the trek to Key Village. What would the rest of you like to do? Uh, well, I guess uh, let's mount up and head to Key Village. Ari, Gorath, you ready? <sighs> We have to. Come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> Put a little pep in the stuff. Mm. You all will hear Sindra as she nudges the sides of her horse. Don't fall behind now. As her horse trots off down Green Coastway Road. Oh, well, I guess we're not even going to get to eat breakfast. All right, let's get going. And uh, I'll mount up on Buttercup and take off. So for those of you who have a point of exhaustion, the day is grueling. Uh, I'd like to have each of you roll me an animal handling check. Uh, now, if you, if I remember correctly, uh, it is one point of exhaustion that makes skill checks at disadvantage. Is that correct? I do believe so. All right. Great. Well, look at that. So Ari Gorath, go ahead and roll me an animal handling checks at a disadvantage. Uh, 10. That's pretty good. 15. That's good as well. Mine is a 16. Excellent. So, since you are riding on mounts, Ari and Gorath, you really won't be exerting too much energy. Uh, this is a good thing. This means that there really shouldn't be a huge risk for having to roll for any extra exhaustion for exerting yourself. Uh, you two will just have to battle through kind of your current level of exhaustion. Uh, you'll both doze off occasionally, getting jostled awake by the horse, uh, kind of drifting or trotting a bit faster. Um, you will encounter a bit of traffic passing you uh, as you all transition from the Green Coast Way Road over to Gateway Road. It takes every bit of the day until you arrive at your destination making good time with your animal handling checks, of course. Uh, as the sky burns orange from the setting sun, coming into view is the capital city of Landgate, a thriving metropolis that is nestled behind two massive stone walls. Resting between those stone walls lies a very wide moat. The city's outer wall stretches to a height of 20 feet before you notice its ramparted parapet tops. A patrol of guards, known as the Guardians of the Gate, can be seen on the parapets of these walls, keeping a watchful eye on the city's outer perimeter. Beyond the first wall lies the moat, which stretches from the inner side of the first wall 50 feet across to the outer side of the second wall. 
The moat is filled with various types of aquatic creatures, desperately searching for their next meal. The final and most intimidating line of land gates defenses is the massive inner wall that towers an additional 20 feet over the outer wall, totaling a monstrous height of 40 feet from the moat's waterline. The tops of these walls are also ramparted parapet tops, like the outer wall, as it also has a regular patrol of the guardians of the gate walking in. The most impressive feature to this monstrosity of stone and mortar is its width. Stretching to an impressive 25 foot wide, its innards house a network of halls, stairs, and various sized chambers, forming a military base for the guardians of the gate. Peaking above the inner wall are four very large circular stone towers that rise 20 feet beyond the already impressive 40 feet inner wall. These four massive stone towers seem to be near Landgate's center as they are home to some of the most brilliant, talented, professional students of abjuration, divination, evocation, and enchantment magics. As you finish taking in the impressive structures of the city's capital, you will notice directly ahead of you two massive iron gates. This is one of two entrances to the capital as the Gateway Road runs into this northwestern entrance through the city center, exiting through the second southwestern entrance. Sindra clears her throat <clears throat> to get everyone's attention. Don't get swept up by the majesty you see before you. Our path lies this way. As Sindra pulls on the reins of her horse, veering off to the right, walking her horse down a smaller, one-cart road that runs south, parallel to Landgate's western wall. A road sign off to the right reads, Urchins Pass, Key Village, Half Mile. Oh, damn. I thought we were going to be going in through Landgate. I was kind of looking forward to it. Never been here. It's nothing special. We can we can definitely avoid it. Let's just go find some place to sleep. Get really stupid bird people. Make me have bad dreams. I don't care. Go wherever. Just find a bed. All right. Yeah, we'll, I agree with Gorath. We'll find a bed. As the party continues to ride down Urchin's Pass, you see before you a quaint, thatch-roofed English Tudor-style village. Illuminated in soft blue flickering light against the newly awakened night sky. Sounds of nocturnal creatures, mixed with sounds of a village, create the surrounding ambience. Alba's home is just at the end of the village, as Sindra continues to walk her horse, leading the group in the direction. You begin noticing along the way large braziers and torches positioned throughout the village as being the source of the soft blue light that flickers about illuminating the area. Several establishments are also noticed on the way to Alba's home. A tavern named Skeleton Key, a general store called Brown's Goods, and lastly, an inn called Lock and Key. Pulling back on the reins, Syndra halts her horse as she dismounts in front of a stepping stone walkway, which leads to a building shaped like a large tortoise shell. Well, this is it. We're here. Let's just hope he's home and not off in the city on business. Sindra will lead her horse to a nearby hitch as she ties it off. Is that is that building a turtle shell? It does appear to be. There. It doesn't look like it has a bed. And we need to go back to the inn because I'm just not dealing with the damn tortoise shell today. Uh, we need to go and talk with Alvis. Uh, you know, that's the reason we kind of came here and accompanied Syndra. I mean, it's a house. It probably has beds, right? A house? <laughs> There's a tortoise shell. Syndra begins walking down the large ruin carved stepping stones which form a walkway leading from the roadside to a sunken wide wooden front door bioluminescent plants form the boundaries of this ruined carved stepping stone path as well as provide soft blue light to it with each step taken each of you notice the carved ruins come to life with a soft blue glow 
you also hear what sounds like a bell in the direction of Alice's home. Halfway down the path, Syndra looks back to each of you as you are kind of bantering about. Are you coming or what? Mm. What do you guys do? I'll holler, yeah, yeah, we're coming, we're coming. And I'll um, hop off to start hitching the horse. All right. I'll hop down and start hitching my horse up as well. Same. <clears throat> All right. Definitely interesting. As well. Yeah. It's got four walls, roof. Basically, I might be able to get some sleep, food, maybe get some drink. Could be my type of place. Yeah, we'll have to see. As you guys complete hitching your horses on the nearby post, you start advancing down the stepping stones to catch up to Sindra. As you all reach the path's end, you step down a few stone steps and find yourself standing in front of a wide wooden front door. Sindra reaches out to knock, but before her knuckles can make contact, the door's handle slowly turns. The door will slowly open, revealing a dimly lit interior. Standing in the doorway, is the large figure of an old, squinty-eyed male turtle. He is dressed in a blue silk wizard's robe with a purple oversized traditional wizard's hat resting on his shell as he steps into full view. Hello, Syndra. I was not expecting you back so soon. Do you have the item? Alba's neck stretches outward towards the group as he squints his eyes, attempting to get a better focus or a better look at each of you. Uh, no, Albus, uh, I, I do not have the item. That's why I'm here sooner than expected. As the turtle's eyes finally focuses on the three of you, he quickly retracts his head back uh, very tight to a shell. What do you mean you do not have it? And who are these folk? Albus, we have much to discuss. Things have become extremely complicated. They can be trusted, rest assured. They're actually the reason I'm here standing before you now. Albus turns back into the interior of his dimly lit home as he begins to slowly move down a wooden set of stairs. Oh, very well, very well, Syndra. You've always been a good judge of character. Come now. It seems we have much to discuss. As he fades into the dark portion of the home's interior, Syndra moves in and heads down the wooden stairs. What do the three of you do? Alright, after you two. Well, it's a little weird that the turtle living inside of a turtle. But at least he's not a filthy mountain dweller. And I'm gonna go in. I'll kind of motion for Kelbrex to go ahead of me because I want to go last. All right, I'll, uh, I'll move in first then. As the three of you move into Albus's home, you each detect the faint smell of earth mixed with natural woods as well as plant life. The sound of water can be heard within the home, soft blue light emanating from strategically placed torches and wall sconces provides the dim lighting which helps you navigate the home's interior. As you reach the bottom of the steps, there are two archways that can be seen. Uh, there is an archway to the left and an archway to the right. As the sound of rippling water can be heard, the archway to the left passes what appears to be a small stone pond, cleverly woven into the home's construction. As stone steps lead into the water, the water's surface has lily pads peacefully floating on top as fish flirt with the surface, indicating the source of the sound of water. The archway to the right passes by a couple of soft-looking beds in some sort of guest area. As you catch the tail end of Albus moving through this archway, Syndra veers to the right as well to follow him. What would the three of you like to do? I want to move forward to follow Syndra. I'll follow as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As you all walk through the right archway, you find yourselves in a very large open room that services as a sitting room, bedroom, as well as a study. The temperature in this room is extremely warm. As you notice at the far end of this large room, 
a freestanding stone dome-shaped fireplace with a roaring fire housed inside. Albus is currently sitting on the stool belonging to his handmade wooden desk that is covered with scrolls, various potion bottles, and numerous other trinkets that sits off to the right of the freestanding stone fireplace. Albus turns himself on his stool to face the center of the room which serves as the main sitting area. The sitting area is composed of three oversized green dragon skin sitting chairs. Each one of these oversized chairs sit around a large round wooden coffee table which is covered in what appears to be overflow from Albus' desk. Various tomes, papers, and other trinkets rest on this table. Syndra moves over to the oversized sitting chair left of the coffee table and takes a seat, leaving two available oversized chairs to sit in. What would you guys like to do? Alright, uh, well, you guys can go sit. I'll be fine. I'd rather stand. Please, don't be shy. Make yourselves at home. You there, large one. You look weary from your travels. These chairs are quite comfortable, I assure you. Uh, will I fit? Yeah, they're large enough to fit your physique. And I'm going to go plop my tired ass down, and I'm going to sit in the center chair. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, I guess if Ari's choosing to stand, I'll go ahead and take the last chair. Okay. Ari, as you stand there, you can't help but feel the uncomfortable stare of Alvis as he squints, trying to focus his eyes on you. You, the tiefling. Have we met before? I feel as if I've seen you before somewhere. No, um, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm sure that it's just me, dear. Also, I, I do have a difficulty seeing and remembering things. The older I get, I should probably see the gnomish tinkerers in Landgate and see if they can make me a pair of focals, or perhaps some type of listening device to hear me better. Uh, anyway, we have much to discuss. Isn't that right, Sandra? Yes, Alice. I wish I was here under better circumstances, but the artifact that I was sent to protect and deliver to the Arcanist has been stolen. I am convinced the assailants were members of a group calling themselves the Call of the Raven. The Call of the Raven? Surely you must be mistaken. That is just a mythical, fictitious story that we tell small children, or for fun around the fire. The people attacking us literally called themselves the Call of the Raven. <laughs> Did they? I, I don't recall you said that. the Raven, at least. Well, no, no. You're thinking of the Bloodhawk Bandits. No. Those were the ones that attacked us in the morning. Those just the Bloodhawk Bandits. the other day, on the road. Oh. You're talking about when we were making our way to the last town. No. On the way here. We have way too many people that wear bird feathers. <laughs> I don't care what they call themselves. We're just... They're there. They said we had something of the raven. That's right. I... I wasn't paying that close attention. Um, yeah. It was very foggy. Well... And we were doing other things. And I did get pretty badly beat up in that fight. Yeah. I got beat up by people that look like birds. I got attacked by a bird. I'm just tired of dealing with birds. <laughs> Albus, I know what I saw. I was attacked by six assailants. Each of them wore cloaks adorned in raven feathers. Each of them wore intimidating porcelain raven mask with glowing blue eyes that peeked out from beneath drawn hoods. I was able to knock off one of these masks and a scrum, but was still unable to see what was behind it. Each of the assailants wielded these unique sickles and seemed to possess some magic abilities. I was violently stabbed with these sickles with intent to kill. I felt the pain of each sickle that was plunged into me. I fought to get the wooden chest, trying to hold on to it with all of my might. But it was ripped from my hands by these ravens as I blacked out. When I came to, I was in a pile of corpses in the back of a wagon, pushed over a hillside. I was able to claw my way from beneath the weight of death. 
I drug myself to a safe clearing, but couldn't feel, couldn't breathe. As my vision began to fade, I felt my soul beginning to lift from my body, and that is when I saw Kelbricks, the Soul Shepherd. As she points over to you, Kelbricks, and his faithful friends. My sincere apologies, Sindra. I had no idea, my dear. Albus looks at each of you. What say the three of you on this matter? Well, <clears throat> the only thing I do know is that apparently, yeah, we have been attacked twice now by uh, these raven fanatics. And, um, yeah, they were wearing raven's feathers each time and did wield some strange claw-like weapons and some sickles, I believe. Albus will slowly get up move to the round coffee table where he grabs a smoking pipe amidst the mess and confusion on the table. And he will slowly move back to his stool and begin packing the pipe. Don't mind me, do go on. Now, whether or not these are members of this group or cult called Call of the Raven, I don't know. But they do seem to be interested in us. Well... Like I said already, they did say we had something that belonged to the Raven. Interesting. What would you all have that would belong to this Raven? They said a map, correct? Yeah. Uh, uh, didn't you pick up a map a couple days ago? Yeah, it was that weird map. I don't know what language it was. Yeah, I I couldn't read that. Gorath, did, did we ever show you that map? Uh, what map? <laughs> That's right. You were too distracted by the shrimp. <laughs> uh, that map. <laughs> yeah, this map. I'm going to pull the map out and hand it over to Gora so you can see it again. Sindra seems shocked as Ari produces the map, handing it over to Gorath, as she was completely unaware that you all had a map. No, she had no idea. As you take a better look at this map, go ahead and give me a history check, Gorath. Hey, 13. Uh, 13 zero for history? The mountains depicted on the map you believe to be your homeland. They look like an early rendering of the Demon Spine Mountains, possibly one to two hundred years ago, based on some of the early depictions that you've seen. Uh, this is a really old map. <laughs> well, that is what they attacked us for. And, uh, by the way, did you flip it over and take a look at the back? Yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, just, yeah, just little scribbles. <laughs> Would you be willing to let me examine that map? Yeah, I'll get up and, uh, hand to Alice and then plop my ass back down that seat again. <laughs> Thank you, my Goliath friend. Now, let's see. What have we? And why the call of the raven want this so bad? Albus will turn back to his desk and begin searching for something. After a few moments, you will hear him say, Ah, here we are. As he will produce an old magnification glass, using it to get a better look. Hmm, very curious. Yes, curious indeed. It seems that this strange script is one that has been forbidden somewhere around one to two centuries ago. As a matter of fact, you will not be able to locate this script in any of our bookeries, nor will any of our scholarly linguists know what it is. Where did you find this? It was on the ground. I stepped on it. This may have been part of the stolen artifact, perhaps fallen out in the raven's hasty retreat. This language, I believe, is Old Draconian, and as fortune would have it, I have a friend who has dedicated his entire life attempting to study this language for the Arcanist. His name is Almasith Sanar. He is of dragon descent. If anyone would understand these ruins, it would be him. The trick is locating him as he is a hermit. Well. If you don't know where to find him, how are we supposed to locate him? <laughs> that is a good question. Let me see here. 
as he will once again turn to his desk and begin rummaging through things. Oh, where is it? Hmm. No, that's not it. Uh, ah, yeah, here it is. Yes, this is it. Albus will turn around and produce a folded parchment letter with a broken wax seal of the Arcanist. He will then unfold the letter, hold it close to his eyes, scanning the letter for something. Ah, here it is. He described to me being on a very long road made for marching, which can only be the Long March Road, which leads to the eastern side of Alteratus. He further goes on to talk about being able to see the Van Borum Peaks just beyond the edge of a forest. This letter is nearly a month old by now, and I haven't heard from him since, so take it for what it's worth. Sintra, perhaps you should accompany your new friends. Uh, make sure they arrive safely in Almasis. Blessings. Albus, if I may ask, what is this artifact? Why is it important to the Call of the Raven to go to such great lengths to obtain it? These are great questions, my dear. Albus will look around cautiously at each of you. Do you trust them, Syndra? I do. Do I have everyone's word that what is discussed here and now will not leave this room? You have my word as a threader. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, what, what were we talking about? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I totally uh, won't tell anyone. I'm probably going to forget. <laughs> <laughs> Gorath, have you been asleep? Very well, very well. Very possible. The artifact inside the wooden chest that you were tasked with bringing to me is an ancient tome called the Faust. The Faust is believed to be a written account of an ancient being who had discovered an arcane equation for immortality, an equation no living creature should have access to. History states that a group of magic wielders had discovered and recovered the Faust from the continent of Stygian. Upon recovery of the Faust, the magic wielders deemed this tome to be too powerful for anyone to gain possession of. With all in agreement, they decided to transport the Faust back to Alteranus, placing it in the protection of what we now call the Vault of the King. Unfortunately, their ship, the Forlorn Hope, mysteriously became lost at sea along with the Faust near the Scaled Islands. It wasn't until recently that a group of four adventurers accidentally discovered the Forlorn Hope. When the Arcanists caught word of this, they paid the group of adventurers handsomely for their findings. That is where you came in, Syndra. As Syndra sits back into her chair, absorbing what was just told, do you, any of you have any questions? Well, <clears throat> I don't want to sound rude or anything, Albus, but... Uh, Why is this our problem? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, yeah. It seems, Sindra, that your judge of character in these three may have been misplaced. While you, Ari, and Kelbrick state the truth, this not being your problem at all, Magical items and ancient artifacts in the wrong hands with wrong intentions is everyone's problem. Take this ancient artifact, the Faust, which claims to grant immortality. Can you each imagine if this falls into the wrong hands? Perhaps it already has fallen into the wrong hands, as this call of the Raven cult seems to have spared no expense to acquire the tome. Think about the willingness and great lengths they have already gone to acquire this map that you have currently in your possession. Oh, but of course, this is not my problem. No, I'm just going to walk away and let everyone else handle it. Now imagine yourself sitting in a tavern one day as a flash of light goes off and all of you, boop, are gone. Innocent, guilty, it matters not. To think. You could have prevented all of it, had you not just walked away from helping young Sindra and myself for the greater good. Uh, well, you do make some fair points. Uh, personally, someone who's trying to make themselves immortal kind of goes against my beliefs. 
uh, defying the laws of mortality, kind of blatantly slaps the Matron of Death in her face. So, I'm not too keen on that. Uh, so, yeah, maybe recovering this tome might be uh, what Morgana has in store for me. Uh, the question is, Ari, Gora, will the two of you aid as well? Well, I suppose if you're just going to keep guild tripping us, <laughs> old, I'll join. The old man was there, and I'm pretty thick. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Uh, I can go back to the deep spine now. Yeah, you were wanting to return home anyways, weren't you? Yep. That's gives me a reason to go anyway. All right. Um, but first, um, we have to find Almaseth. Albus, you made mention that Almaseth is of dragon descent, correct? Yes, he is what is called a dragonborn. I'm almost certain that none of you have ever seen one, given the fact that they have almost all been exiled to a large chain of islands called the Scaled Islands after the Surge. While dragonborns still live on Alteratus, they tend to remain in hiding for fear of being deported back to the Scaled Islands. Okay, and you said that uh, he's somewhere in the woods by the Van Boer Mountains, correct? According to his cryptic letter, yes. Oh, here, let me see when it's at. Albus will move back to his desk, once again, rummaging through the various things littering the top, until he finds what he is searching for. As he turns, you all see in his hand a large piece of parchment as he slowly walks over to the coffee table and lays it out for each of you to see. Since you have all agreed to aid Syndra and the Arcanist in this current task at hand, allow me to present this to you as payment upon completion, of course. I'm going to walk over to the table, pick it up, and see what it is. It is a deed to a parcel of land that contains a small homestead on it. The property is located to the south, uh, in between the capital of Landgate and the port town of Wareshire, somewhere around 10 to 15 miles off the Gateway Road. I'm going to go ahead and pull out our map and see if I can get an idea as to where El Masif might be roughly. Um, this way we can kind of have a starting point to begin searching for him. Uh, Ari, would you mind giving me a hand with this? Yeah, I'll make my way over. Take a look and assist. Alright, so he mentioned traveling down the Long March Road heading east, correct? Yeah, I believe he said in the edge of a forest just before or the Van Boren Mountains. Alright, so I'm wondering if uh, you might be on the tip of this forest here that runs almost parallel to the Long March Road. Right here somewhere would be the edge. I think that might be where we need, we need to go. And if not, it probably is a good place to start. And I'll point it out to everyone and uh, borrow a quill that's already in one of the ink wells on his table and kind of circle it on the map. This is going to be a... Uh, a little bit of a fun journey. It's definitely going to be a long journey. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, we'll definitely need to stock up on a few things before we leave. Luckily, uh, I think Landgate will have everything that we need. Uh, Landgate does indeed have quite a bit of a purchase. That's for sure. The prices are top cool. Well, there's a pretty good general store here in Key Village. Brahms Goods road past it about halfway to houses. Prices are a bit fairer and can be negotiated better there, as opposed to the shops of Landgate. Okay, Sandra, that uh, sounds like it might do. We can go there in the morning before we set out. Ah, but Landgate is a place where you can find a lot of curious things, finely crafted armor, weapons, and items. Well, I believe uh, needing only simple items, such as rations, stuff like that for the journey. Rom's good sounds like it'd be a good place to get all of that. Uh, that is unless there's something else in particular that you guys might need. Not from Landgate. Uh, no, no, we need to travel light and swift. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Albus. Yeah, thanks, Albus. Uh, we, I guess, should see about getting a room to bed down for the night. Uh, Gorath, you look like you could use a good night's rest. I could as well. And we think we passed an inn on the way in as well. The Lock and Key Inn is the name. I've stayed there quite a bit. I know the innkeeper. 
he's a pretty good guy that I like to support whenever I'm in town. He works for me. Yeah, that sounds fine. All right, sounds good. Oh, and uh, Albus, one more thing. Do you have something that could be used as like a letter of introduction or something for Almesa? Uh, hmm. Oh, as a matter of fact, I do. Albus will once again return to his desk, this time opening a small wooden chest that rests near the back of the desk. Opening with a creak, he reaches inside and pulls out a green dragon scale. He extends it to whomever wishes to take it. I'll go ahead and grab it. This was a gift given to me by Amesa many years ago. Show this to him. When he sees it, he will know that you have come on my behalf, as well as the behalf of the Arcanist, but more specifically, me. Okay, I believe that'll work. Um, can't think of anything else that we might need. Any of you? No, we're going to get supplies in the morning. All right. Um, yeah, let's... Uh... Well, we got the platinum from completing the job for the uh, wagon, so... And we have some gold from the caravan job earlier. Might as well uh, see what those rings and claws we scavenged from the Caw of the Raven might be able to bring us. Speaking of the rings, I want to show mine to Albus and ask him if he would know how to use it. You move over towards Albus, extending your hand with the ring uh, in it asking him if he would mind taking a look at what you had found. He'll extend his large reptilian hand, palm side up, as you place it in. He then begins rubbing the ring between his thumb and forefinger. He closes his eyes and begins to hum softly, all while continuing to rub the ring. After a few moments, he opens his eyes, slightly baffled as he asks, Where did you get this? Off the ground. Didn't Albus, step on it this time, though. Albus is going to go ahead and make an insight check. That one, she actually did get off the ground. I feel as if that is not entirely correct, but not the matter. It's not untrue. Nevertheless, the ring itself contains several magic components to it. I believe it houses several low-powered spells that can be used once you have taken time to connect or attune with this ring. The strange markings or engravings, as well as the energies emanating from the ring, feel strange. Would you allow me to hold on to this ring for a bit, so that I may study it? Yeah, that's fine. Perhaps when you return from our masons, I will have a better explanation as to what it does and why it is so intriguing. I'm going to let him keep that one, and then I'll just reach into my pouch. Well the other ring I have, that's the exact copy, and then just slide it on my finger. <laughs> As all this happens and takes place, you all notice that Syndra has taken her leave, presumably heading to the lock and key in. Anything else, guys? Uh, I think we're good. I'm good. Alright, well, might as well head to the end following Syndra. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we head out, uh, I'm going to make my way over to the pond and I'm gonna put my hand in it. Is the water cold or warm the water temperature is actually room temperature well i'm tired and i've been sweating because of this fire in here and i am a cold weather creature so i'm gonna dip my head in there <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so you move off getting on your knees as you plunge your massive head into the pond as you feel the sweet relief you open your eyes underwater to see that there are these large koi fish looking back at you. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, <laughs> I'm just gonna ignore them, and I don't care. I'm just gonna cool down now. Okay, then. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and this is where we'll stop our story until next time. <laughs> <laughs>